Hello, welcome along, Explorer. It's almost Halloween, so how about we discover some spooky stuff for ourselves? And we're heading across the universe to search for it. It's a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name's Dan, this is the place where we discover all those science secrets lurking here, there, and all over the place. And we answer the questions that you've thought of, but never asked. This week, we're finding out how a seed grows into a plant with the help of sunlight, water, and an expert who can explain everything. Basically, it's rehydration process. So seeds are are remarkable because they've evolved to become almost dry. And so when the water comes back into the seed, it activates all of these biological processes in this super cool way. Also, our Battle of the Sciences takes us back billions of years to the very first moments of evolution. You get to dig them up and then you get to think about them and what, what, they, what the fossil means. You know, why is it the shape it is? Uh, what do we think this bone or tooth was in the animal? And what was the animal doing? So, in other words, try to turn dry bones and teeth into living animals. And your Dangerous Dan this week is all about an animal who loved a headbutt. It's on the way in a brand new Fun Kids Science Weekly. Let's start with your science in the news then. And a huge meteorite first discovered in 2014 was said to have hit Earth billions of years ago. It caused a tsunami bigger than any other known and it boiled the oceans. Scientists have discovered this after hiking to the impact site in South Africa to chisel bits of rock from the ground where it hit to better understand the crash. The meteorite, named S2, was massive. It hit our Earth three billion years ago. Now, the most famous meteorite ever, really, the one that led to the dinosaur's extinction, was 66 million years ago. It was about 10 kilometres wide, which is almost the same size as Mount Everest. This one, though, S2, is way older and much bigger. It was 50 kilometres wide. Its mass, the stuff in it, was maybe 200 times greater than the dinosaurs one. It was enormous, and experts think it caused the biggest tsunami ever, and it boiled the oceans with all that energy. Isn't it amazing that we can figure out so much about a rock that hit planet Earth three billion years ago that we know almost exactly what happened just by chopping off a little bit of rock and studying it. It's it's mind-melting, isn't it? Also this week, it's been discovered that polar bears get sicker as the ice gets warmer. Scientists have studied samples of polar bear blood gathered from creatures in the sea between Alaska and Russia over the course of 30 years, and they've discovered something quite sad. As the Arctic warms, as the ice melts polar bears face a growing risk of viruses, bacteria and parasites. So it shows they're getting sicker now, much more so than they were 30 years ago, because there's signs of this bacteria in their blood where there wasn't before. Experts think it's linked to more viruses being able to live and thrive in warmer temperatures. It it just shows the impact that we have, doesn't it? What our climate crisis does to every type of creature all around the world and it can have some pretty devastating effects and our final story this week let's hear more about the spacecraft that we discussed last time it's on the hunt for signs of alien life on one of jupiter's icy moons it's blasted off from cape canaveral over in florida this is the europa clipper let's find out more with mark fox powell from the open university mark thank you so much for joining us how exciting is this in the space world this is, this is a huge moment, actually. So for those of us who are lucky enough to study these icy worlds, moons of Jupiter and Saturn that we think have subsurface, so under, underground liquid water oceans, uh, this is a huge landmark moment. So we had last year the European Space Agency's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer mission launch, and now we've just had NASA's Europa Clipper. And these missions together are going to absolutely transform our knowledge of worlds like Europa. Um, So at the moment, we are making a lot of um, sort of guesswork and predictions based on some measurements taken decades ago by other missions. And now we're going to finally understand, finally answer some of those predictions and test them um, and, and just learn a huge amount more about these worlds. So, well, scientists think that 
Under this moon's surface could be an ocean with double the amount of water that's here on Earth. And we're always hearing that one of the key signs for alien life as we know it is water. So is the thinking, Mark, that there might have been aliens of some form on that rock at some point? Have they come from somewhere else? Were they all living on Europa? What are we dreaming of right now? Yeah, I mean, these are great questions. And these are the kinds of questions that uh, actually motivate this mission in the first place. So we have good reason to believe that there is a huge ocean of liquid water at Europa. Um, It's locked underneath the ice, so we can't see it directly, but we can see evidence for where it might have uh, emerged onto the surface through cracks in the ice. And we can study those cracks with the spacecraft to learn more about the ocean underneath. Uh, But it's it's really exciting because um, this... We think we, we have good good evidence that there's already that there's liquid water there. So that's a big tick when we're searching for life. We know that life has um, it has to do chemistry, and to do chemistry, it needs water. So all life on Earth requires water. All life that we know of requires water, and so that water is a key ingredient. But it's not the only ingredient. We also need energy and some of the raw building blocks, some of the chemical elements that that we build life from. And those are the kind of things that we that are currently question marks about Europa. So missions like Europe Clipper are going to help us understand whether the ocean has enough energy uh, and enough of the building blocks uh, in order to support life. And if it does, then the next exciting question would be, you know, has life actually originated and emerged at Europa itself? When a spacecraft like this lands on Europa, or yeah, for instance, a rover on Mars. It, is it working all the time? Is, is it never resting or does it do a bit here and there? We never really, apart from a few photos, know what it gets up to. So what will Europa Clipper be doing when it lands? Yeah, a really interesting question. So and it's quite different with these different missions. So on Mars, of course, we land often with a rover and that rover spends a lot of its time just sort of sat there waiting for a command from Earth. They take everything very cautiously, very slowly. They only move when they're very sure that they're not going to hurt the rover. Uh, whereas Europa Clipper isn't landing. It's it's an orbiting spacecraft. It's going to go into orbit around Jupiter and do lots and lots of close flybys of Europa gradually. So orbit after orbit, it will fly past a different part of Europa and make a map of a different part of the surface. And it is going to be working all the time. So during these close flybys, it will be using various scientific instruments to take pictures of the surface, to use radar to peer under the surface, But then in the long orbit around Jupiter, when it moves away from Europa, it's going to be sending that data back to Earth. Uh, And it does this to avoid the really intense sort of radiation that we find near Europa. And that's to do with Jupiter's magnetic field. So to avoid that, it goes into this long orbit around Jupiter, where um, it spends most of its time actually away from Europa, sending back information to Earth and picking up new commands, getting ready for the next dive close in past Europa. Well, it's it's not going to get there, scientists think, until 2030. So that's, what, five years of travelling through space. In that time, is it on its own? Are people down in America over at NASA, are they doing a lot of commands? How much work will they be giving it as it flies? There are uh, little flurries of activity, but actually a lot of it is coasting. So we give it, we kick it, launch it from Earth with enough energy to, to, to fly its trajectory. And there may be some slight course corrections, but it basically will use uh, the gravity of the Earth, actually, and Mars through a series of flybys to help speed it up like a slingshot to get enough energy to go out to Jupiter. So most of that time, it just coasts. What, we, what the scientists will be doing and the engineers who run the mission uh, over the next few weeks and months will be testing the instrumentation, making sure everything's happy and healthy after the launch. And certainly when we get to these close flybys of Mars and Earth, that will give us an opportunity to, to really understand and you know, make sure the spacecraft working fine. But there is a lot of waiting involved in these outer solar system missions going to places like Jupiter. Um, but the waiting should be worth it. Uh, y- you mentioned earlier it's it's chasing uh, another mission from uh, the ESA, the European Space Agency, which, which left last year. But the Clipper is going to overtake it. It's doing something called a cosmic piggyback. I've heard. Is that is that allowed? Is it a bit of a competition? What what's happening there? Yeah, it's not a race. Um, the the two missions are doing um, uh, complementary but different things. And they were launched on different rockets, which means they have slightly different 
energies and speeds when they're in, uh, you know, from that launch. Um, so because of that, there's just a slight difference in their travel times. So yes, Europa Clip will arrive at Jupiter slightly before Juice, even though it launched afterwards. Uh, and that's because there was just more energy in the launch. They're just the spacecraft is traveling at a greater velocity. Um, but they are targeting different things. So Juice is going to do a couple of flybys of Europa, um, and that will help complementary science with Europa Clipper, and they can share some information. But actually, most of the Juice mission is really exciting. It's going to go into orbit of one of Jupiter's other moons, Ganymede, which is the largest moon in the solar system. Um, and it's, it's the first time that a, man, a human-made object has gone into orbit around a moon of another planet that's not our moon. Um, and Ganymede also has an ocean underneath the surface, so a lot more we can learn about Ganymede. So together, these two missions are going to help us understand the Jupiter moons in a lot more detail. There seems to have been a real excitement of space activity over the last year or so. Uh, only the other day, we saw Elon Musk's SpaceX company manage to catch a rocket that was falling to Earth, and we've had these two missions over to Jupiter. Um, it seems like it's all happening right now, but how long has that, that been in the making for? For a, a project like uh, the Europa Clipper, how long have they been thinking about this? Well, I mean, these active solar system missions do take a long time. Um, there's a lot of uh, sort of convincing of the relevant you know, people who have the money to pay for them in the first place. So in this case, it's NASA. So it's an American mission. Um, and the planning and everything has to get mapped out in detail and the instruments have to get built. So we're looking at, you know, 20 years or more to develop a mission like this. And that's up to launch. And then, of course, after the launch, you have six years to get there and then a few years doing the science. And then it will be probably another 10 to 20 years or more of understanding all that data. So there's actually whole careers of, of science to, to just understand the findings from these missions. Uh, people could work their entire scientific careers just unpicking this stuff on one mission. So I think, it, you know, it's, it, it is, it is, these are long time scales, but that's what makes them so exciting. It's because, you know, they, we, we wait so long for the information and when it comes, it transforms our knowledge. And how amazing is it that it, it's all happening right now when, when, when we're here? Well, so, so thrilling. Listen, Mark Fox Powell, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. We always have an expert bringing you a brilliant science story every single week on our podcast. And we get an expert to try and sort out a question that you've got. If you've got anything sciencey floating around your head, something you are desperate to sort out, desperate to know the answer to, make sure you drop it as a voice note to me on the free Fun Kids app. If you get to funkidslive.com, there's a big record button. Smash it there. Let me know who you are and what your question is. Uh, first up this week, this is a message sent to me by Kitty, who is 11, who wants to know how do touch screens work? Well, in your phone screen or your tablet, you've got two layers. You've got a plastic one on top normally and, and a glass one underneath. There is electricity running underneath that, right? It goes up and down, side to side. It makes like a grid, the electricity, almost a net. It's on all the time. It's rushing here, there and everywhere. When you touch your phone screen, you push those two layers together, the plastic and the glass. That then touches the electrical current, which changes the way it moves. And the electricity knows that because it's laid out, as I say, in this grid system. It knows where your thumb has touched because of the electricity moving around that grid. So the computer inside can figure out based on that electricity being affected on the grid, exactly where you're touching. And that means it can move the cursor, it can move things around on the screen based on what you're doing. So Kitty, that is how touch screens work. It's all to do with electricity in a grid and a couple of screens. Thank you. Let's get on another one then. This has been sent in by a voice note to the Free Fun Kids app. Uh, it's a really good one. It's one of those questions that you think about all the time but maybe never actually properly ask it's from winnie what do you have winnie how does water and sunlight help seeds grow well winnie thank you so much for that question how does water and sunlight help seeds grow uh well we should find out because i think it's one of the most important fundamental building blocks of all life on planet earth as we know it so let's sort it out shall we with professor julian hibbard from the university of cambridge uh, julian thank you for joining us i i, I think i'm right you know uh, water and sunlight helping seeds to grow it's very important yeah 
Yeah, yeah, super important. And it's sort of really interesting because the seed is like very inert thing. It contains everything you need to get in the next generation. It contains a tiny little plant we call an embryo. It contains food reserves, but they're just sitting there in this really dormant state until water comes along and then normally a bit of light later on. So it's an fu- absolutely fundamental process. So we've got those two things. We've got water and light that turn this tiny seed. As you say, it's got everything it needs to make Summit bigger. How does it work? How do they all work together to, to grow? So what happens is when the seed detects water around it, that switches off a dormancy process. It activates the seed, it activates some quite complex but beautiful biochemistry. So the reserves I just mentioned, it could be protein, it could be starch, it could be oils, they start to be made into things that help the plant grow. So that biochemistry happens, the the roots start to grow out of the seed, the leaves start to grow out of the seed. So you see these really big changes to what it looks like as well. And all of that is initiated by the presence and the ability of the seed to detect the water around it. So it's not getting much sunlight at that point then? Very often it's in the soil, so completely um, no, no light available until, this is really clever, until the plant when it's growing starts to detect gravity and the roots detect gravity and they say, right, I'm going to go down to get more water and get nutrients and the shoot detects gravity and it grows upwards away from the soil out into the light so that it can then capture the light for further growth. It's, and this is all, it's tiny. It's a really tiny, looks to be a simple thing, but this is such a complicated process. You said it right at the start that the, the seed detects water. How is it doing that? Is it by touch, by smell, by taste? What's happening? Oh, is it? <laughs> um, we don't think it's by smell. I can say that much. Um, basically, it's rehydration process. So all uh, everything, we almost everything in biology Um, is completely dependent on water, right? And so seeds are are remarkable because because they've evolved to become almost dry. So only 10% of a seed is is, um, down to 10% is water. And so when the water comes back into the seed, it activates all of these biological processes in this super cool way. So let's just get it a bit bigger then. Our seed has sprouted through the soil. It's now becoming the very early stages of a, of a plant. How is it using water? How is it using sunlight now? So now, once the leaves or the shoots are out of the soil and they, they can detect the light, um, they've made special molecules which allow the light to be harvested. And amazingly, that light energy that they harvest is then used to split water. And splitting water provides energy, and that energy is then used to fix carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, CO2, into sugars, and the sugars then power the rest of the growth. So all of this is interlinked in a way. The the water is important, the light is important, the extraction of the energy from the water is super important, um, and then that allows growth to proceed from then onwards. We've got different types of plants that need different levels of both water and sunlight uh, especially plants that you might find actually in the ocean in water themselves even though they need different levels is it still working in pretty much the same way do we know the photosynthetic process which is converting light energy and using it to generate sugars is really highly conserved in all plants and actually what plants do you can see happening in photosynthetic bacteria. And the photosynthetic bacteria evolved this system billions of years ago. And that same system of extracting energy from light and and splitting water and doing photosynthesis is still used by plants today on land. How incredible is it? We speak quite a lot about uh, evolution and survival of the fittest. And these plants figured out how to do this, as you say, billions of years ago. And they've never needed to change it because it works pretty well. Uh, It's been a real joy, Professor Julian Hibbard. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure. And thank you to Julian for coming on the show. If you have anything science-y that you want answered on the podcast, make sure you leave it as a voice note on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. Let's get on with this week's Dangerous Dan then. Every single episode, we discover some of the weirdest, most unique, strange and devastating things that have ever existed. 
And this time, we're headed back 70 million years ago to the late Cretaceous period to take a look at a creature that loved a headbutt. The patchy Cephalosaurus was quite a lightweight, slim dinosaur. It walked on two legs, a lot like a T-Rex. It could move very quickly when it needed to. They weighed about half a tonne, which is well, pretty slender for a dinosaur, really. It was about four metres from the bottom of its tail to the tip of its head, and that head is where things get interesting. It had a large, thick dome on its skull, this round thing that juts out. It's almost like it's wearing a bowl where its hair should be. Could be about 10 inches thick, which is huge, 25 centimetres, and it used it to ram, to smash, to butt. It would bang in attack or defence. It's thought that the Apache Cephalosaurus would have headbutting contests like goats and rams do today. They would smash their thick heads into each other and fight for dominance, to be the best, to be the leader. And the chunky domes on their heads would help them absorb the impact, which is why I love it. I love the fact that we hear about so many strange dinosaurs that look completely alien to anything you would see today. And this one, with its massive thick head, means the patchy Cephalosaurus goes straight onto our Dangerous Dan list. This week for Battle of the Sciences, where we tried to find out definitively and prove the greatest science in the history of the universe... We are learning about something that I have never heard of before. Two amazingly complex words squashed together. One of those words sounds like two halves of a word that should be together. It fries my brain. Let's get yours around it. We're with Professor John Stewart from Bournemouth University. It's all about evolutionary paleoecology. Uh, John, you have one minute to tell us why evolutionary paleoecology is the best science in the world. That minute starts in three, two, one, go. So evolutionary paleoecology, and I'm having trouble saying the word myself, um, is essentially why animals and plants evolved. So you will know presumably something about the idea of evolution, how everything changes through time, and this is why they evolved. So the, to break the words down, evolutionary is basically the evolution part, and paleoecology is ancient ecology. So it's why things are evolving in relation to the old ecology. So I was thinking about what a good example would be to try and sell it to you. So, for example, probably one of the the big famous animals that people talk about at the moment is the megalodon shark. The megalodon shark evolved over a period of 70 odd million years and then died out maybe about two and a half million years ago. During that time, its teeth got bigger and bigger and bigger until they're about the size of my hand, an adult hand, about six inches long. Now, by the time they got to that size, you have to think, why were they getting so big? They were getting big because they were eating whales. And it wasn't just the whales, it was the bones of the whales. They had to have big teeth. John! John, that's your minute done, right. but you, you, you've set my senses, you've set my imagination uh, aflame. There's so many questions I can ask. And I think my first one will be, I apologise for interrupting. Don't that's worry. the form of the show. Please carry on and tell me all about the megalodon's teeth and why they're important with whales. Well, if you, could, you, you think of a whale, of course, they look like a great big lump of blubber. But of course, they've got bones inside them, just as we have. And if you're a shark and you're going to eat a whale, there's a good chance you're going to bite into the bone. So you have to have big teeth um, and big, thick teeth, teeth that are um, able to withstand the forces that that take place when you bite into a bone. So evolution has made their teeth thicker and bigger uh, because of what they're eating. And this is this is essentially what we think has happened. You you broke down the, 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 the word for us, evolutionary to do with evolution paleoecology so this is ancient ecology what do you define as ancient ecology john how far back are you looking and when when do you stop looking when you when do you say that's not ancient that's modern yeah um so ancient could be any anything throughout the time of the existence of life on earth which is uh, billions of years rather than millions of years so that's thousands of millions of years my personal study is um, the, the Ice Ages. So that's the last two and a half million years. Um, I mentioned Megalodon. They're older than that, but I happen to collect shark's teeth. So that's why I happen to know about that. Um, but, but paleo, when does it end? Well, that, that's a bit like asking when is something a fossil, you know, and when is it just a bone, for example? Um, I mean, it, it depends on who you talk to, really. 
I tend to treat anything uh, that is <clears throat> that is just a bone has been dug up out of the ground as a fossil. I don't worry too much about <clears throat> about its age uh, because the problems that you have to deal with when you're just looking at a bone without meat on it, without you know skin, and it's not alive. Um, you've got the same problems whether it's several million years old or it's just a few hundred years old. So I tend to treat it all as as ancient, if that if that makes sense. It does. When you're looking at evolution from millions and even billions of years ago, uh, are you able to pinpoint a moment where creatures evolve into what they end up becoming? Is it like one long process or are you looking at a megalodon and you're thinking, normal, normal, normal. Ah, this is the moment where something's changing. Again, that yes, that's a very good question. So, so... In my um, subject, we do have a thing called evolutionary rates. Now, again, that's a, 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 a slightly posh way of describing how fast evolution takes place. And there are different ideas. Some people think it is just gradual and some people think it stays the same. And then suddenly you get a change. Um, my view is it's probably a bit of both. Um, it also depends on how close you get to what you're looking at. Um, if, if something's happening in front of your eyes, it'll look like it's very sudden. Uh, but if, it, if it's at a distance, uh, it might not seem quite so sudden. And, and when I say distance, I'm talking about time, not, not, not uh, geographical distance. Uh, we, well, I've checked to all manner of scientists. And what always blows my mind is the different amounts of fields that you can specialise in. You've chosen evolutionary paleoecology. Um, what do you love about it? What, what do you love about what you get to do every day about the things that you're looking up from billions of years ago? Well, I think what I love most is actually digging things up, looking for fossils. And then you get to dig them up and then you get to think about them and what, what, they, what the fossil means. You know, why is it the shape it is? Uh, what do we think this bone or tooth was in the animal? Why, you know, why, why is it the shape it is? And what was the animal doing? So in other words, try to turn dry bones and teeth into living animals and trying to visualize them in their environment, living, breathing, eating, running around, swimming around, uh, all of that stuff. Like you might see, uh, it's turning dry bones into a documentary by David Attenborough. That's how I look at it. Mm -hmm. uh, my last question on Battle of the Sciences is always the same, John. Let me throw you forward uh, 20, 30 years, whenever it is, you are going to hang up your lab coat, put down your trowel and spade and stop digging up bones. When you call a day on your science career, what's the one question that you want answered? What do you really want to know and discover in the field of evolutionary paleoecology? Gosh, <laughs> that's a big question. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, I think um, what's happening at the moment is we're managing to get uh, DNA out of bones. So DNA are the is, uh, are the chemicals that tell the uh, that are the instructions on how the animal ends the way it is. We're managing to get this out of the bones. I think what I'd like to see is how we move forwards and how we're going to marry the two the two subjects, the dry bones which I study, and this sort of biochemistry from the bones, and see how we can make sense of how evolution takes place over time using both those disciplines. Um, one is much more complicated, the, the, the DNA part. That's not what I do. But, but I do work with people who do this. So basically, th this, these chemicals tell you it's the instructions on, on how the animal should be. So if we can get the instructions on how the animal should be and the physical remains of the animals and they match, well, then we're starting to understand evolution in a, in a really fun, th thorough way. It's a good argument, the fight for evolutionary paleoecology from Professor John Stewart. Thank you for joining us, John. OK, thank you very much. Earlier on in the show, we heard from Julian Hibbard, didn't we? It's chatting all about seeds and how they grow with sunlight, with water. We can learn a bit more about how things grow right now uh, with our trusty explorer pal, Marina Ventura. This is an episode from her inside biology series where she learns all about different bits of wildlife how they're made how they grow and thrive and we could follow marina as she gets up close with plants making seeds it's all about pollination marina ventura inside biology with the society of biology hold on tight hi again 
We're checking out pollination today. That's what needs to happen for a plant to make a seed. And it all starts with, you guessed it, pollen. <laughs> pollen is definitely very good at getting up your nose if you have hay fever, but there's a lot more to it than that. Pollen are tiny dust-like particles produced by stamens in flowers. Stamens are the male parts of the flower. One flower can make over 7,000 particles of pollen, but only a few are needed to fertilize the female parts of the flower, called the stigma. But they have to get from stamen to stigma somehow, and that's called pollination. This grassy field is perfect for showing us one of the ways it's done. Some flowers, like these grasses, are pollinated by the wind. Look! We can see the tall, wispy stamens are just the right shape to catch the wind, blowing the pollen from stamen to stigma so the seeds can be made. Job done! And here's another way pollination can happen. Insects! They're attracted to the flowers by their scent and brightly coloured petals. As they dig around for the nectar and travel from flower to flower, pollen is carried on their bodies from stamen to the stigma. Again, a job well done. And you thought that all those nice smells and colours were for our benefit. I bet that MapApp can sniff out some more cool facts for us about pollination. Of course. The electronic essential for every explorer. Flowers are very choosy about what pollinates them and will put on a show to attract just the right creature. If a flower is best pollinated by bees and butterflies, it's likely to be very colourful with a strong smell. Mmm. Flowers that want to attract bats or moths are often white and so easier to see in the dark. They also tend to be scented more at night when their pollinators are active. But what about the stink cabbage or the dead horse arum lily? Like their name suggests, these unusual plants smell terrible. But that horrible pong is for good reason. These plants are pollinated by beetles that feed on dead or rotting matter and so need to smell just as whiffy to attract the beetles. Phew! I don't think you'd want to pick a bunch of those. Time for us to go, but we'll see you next time. In the meantime, find out more at funkidslive.com forward slash biology. Marina Ventura inside biology with the Society of Biology. Hold on tight. And that's it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for all of our geniuses for coming on the show. And thank you for listening. If you have anything sciencey that you'd love answered next week, make sure you leave it as a voice note for me on the free Fun Kids app or at funkidslive.com. You heard from Marina Ventura a second ago. We've got loads more brilliant podcasts just like that wherever you're listening to this. It's on Google, Apple, Spotify. It's on our app and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids, we are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen all over the country on the free Fun Kids app at funkidslive.com too. And if you've got a smart speaker, wake it up and ask it to play Fun Kids. <laughs>